Ever play a game that's so good that you expect everyone to just know what it is, but then come and find out it's one of the most obscure things ever and that practically no one's ever heard of it, and your friends think you're really weird for playing something that no one knows about? I sure have, more times than I can count, and one of those many games but least deserving of its obscure status is Monolith's Claw, also known by fans as Captain Claw. It's a pretty much perfected art of the 2D side-scrolling variety, but nobody knows it exists. What the hell happened? Why not? Would I lie to you, baby? Would I lie to you? Let's find out. Claw's history goes a little bit back to the late 90s. There was a little group called Q Studios, and they formed into a group that, if you're into games, you've definitely heard of at some point. That group being none other than Monolith Productions, known today for their work on the Shadow of War, Shadow of Mortar games, Fear, Condemned, Blood, and other stuff. And they were pretty small back then, as you might have guessed. When they started up, they split into two teams. The first one was a continuation of their current project called Horror 3D, Horror 3D, that was set to be published by 3D Realms, which turned into the best game ever made, aka Blood, which I can never shut the hell up about. If you're new to this channel or somehow have never heard of that masterpiece, it's a very gory, late 90s FPS that took the gameplay and personality of Duke Nukem, shoved it into an oven, cracked it up to 300 degrees and cooked it, grabbed it out of the oven, and slammed it down on the table with some of the most creatively designed levels, polished mechanics and design choices, best atmosphere I have ever seen in a game, best humor, it's... Oh my god, dude, this game is f***ing amazing. The combat was the goriest to date, at least at the time, and the humor was changed from what everyone was used to in Duke Nukem, with a guy that, you know, parodies action movie heroes to some insanely overpowered undead gunslinger dude that has zero concern for anyone else, voiced by the legendary Stephen White. It's... It's so good, man. It's just... Oh. If I talk about it anymore, I'm probably gonna be here for the rest of the day, so I'm just gonna get on with the video. It was my first review on this channel, and it's still my favorite game of all time, but I don't know. I think I might have to redo my blood video. Anyways, going back to Claw, the other team at Monolith decided to work on this game, which turned out to be Claw, or Captain Claw as it's also known. Like Blood, this was another fast-paced, intense, action-heavy game, but this time instead of being a gory, horror movie-inspired first-person shooter, it was a sort of family-friendly, colorful 2D side-scrolling platformer. Two games that almost took a complete 180 degree turn from each other in opposite directions, at least regarding tone, making you question if these really came from the same guys, even though they technically didn't, but both were still very fast and tense games from Monolith. Claw's original concept was created by Monolith co-founder Garrett Price when he was just in art school. He wanted the story to revolve around a pirate cat who's kind of a loner but also adventurous and lovable towards his crew. He wasn't based on a particular pirate, but according to him, the closest figure to him would be Captain Kidd. The aesthetic of the game was inspired by the pirate fashion of the band Adam and the Ants, and also the animated film Secret of Nim. Nim, I, I don't remember how you pronounce that. They really went all out on those animation scenes, as they were all hand-drawn and hand-animated, and they even had a classic cell animator. That, plus the scenes were created by ex-Disney animators, so... With that in mind, the outcome of them being so damn good and so high quality isn't really that much of a surprise. At least not to me. I'm not too sure what happened during development, since info regarding it is practically non-existent and impossible to find, but I do know that they intended Claw to be the first game to ever support, get this, 256 player multiplayer matches using National Amusement Network. 256 players at once. MMOs aside, not a single game nowadays can even do that. That was extremely overscoped, because neither could they. 
so they lowered it down to 64, which was still really, really high for the time, and probably the only game then to support that. Claw was eventually published by Wizardworks and released on September 5th, 1997, only a few months after Blood. If you lived here in America, there were only two ways you could get this game. The first one is going to the store and picking up this absolute beauty from the shelf. These days an extreme rarity when it comes to PC game collecting. The front is all colorful and shiny and embossed and it's just the way I like my boxes. I also really love the artwork here too. He looks strangely amused by something and then there's like this parrot thing that's just chilling on his shoulder. I love the large in-your-face title, the coins and the ship sailing in the background, and this whole feeling of this artwork being on some sort of treasure map, I mean it really sets the tone perfectly for the game. The sides each show the logo with a select screenshot, each saying the swashbuckling adventure of nine lifetimes. Get it? Cause he's a pussy. There's the system requirements on the bottom, which looking at it you can probably tell that the game was super easy to get working on even most low-end machines at the time. Flipping it over to the back, you can see even more shiny embossed stuff. The game logo, all of these characters, and even this little amulet thing. Ah, man. Every time I look at this box, I just drool. Without a doubt, one of my favorite boxes of my entire collection. For more reasons than just the box itself, and I'll get to that in a little bit, but, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff mentioned on the back, and if the beautiful cover art wasn't enough, the entire back was sure enough to get you. At least, if 2D games interested you at the time, because this sold like crap. I'll give you a second to read everything, so feel free to pause if you want to. Now, while there is a lot here to take in, I think the most notable and impressive one by far is the blurb here on the left saying unparalleled multiplayer support. And it had every right to say that, because, like I said, 64-person multiplayer? In 1997? Yeah, that's just nuts. Sadly, despite this superbly stunning packaging, to call the contents a disappointment would be an understatement, even though I knew exactly what was in here when I bought it. Inside the box, all it has is a registration card and a paper sleeve containing the game on a CD-ROM disc, and the manual. And I kinda hesitate to call it a manual even, cause it's like two or three pages long and it's just text. There's no pictures or cool art or anything, it's just installation, which you don't really even need cause you just put the disc in and you install it, like, ah, so much wasted potential with the contents, but it's fine, I guess. The box is freaking amazing and makes a really cool display piece. So I was really happy to get this when I got it. It's really sad since this game's box is so expressive and in your face and it really, really captures the spirit of the game. Moving on, the only other way to get it at the time was if you bought a Creative Labs DVD drive, meaning you could get the DVD version of this game which boasted much higher quality on the cutscenes and some slightly improved graphics. And yeah, you heard me right, a freaking DVD in 1997. This was definitely one of, if not the very first game to come on this format. Inside the kit, you would obviously get the DVD drive, and it would come with a DVD version of one of the Wing Commander games, and this version of Claw inside a neat little sleeve. Inside the sleeve came this registration card, and of course the game itself on this DVD disc. There were other various methods of getting this specific DVD disc somehow, with the discs mostly looking like this one that I'm holding, for some reason. These became randomly distributed with various things, while the other one from earlier that looks like a treasure map is the retail one that came inside the box. Finding a loose disc that was distributed randomly isn't too difficult to find, even though it is a little on the pricier side, especially for just a disc by itself. But if you want either the boxed CD version or the sleeved DVD version, well, the DVD sleeve version pops up a few times a year maybe, so while it is rather rare, it's not impossible to find, and it usually goes anywhere between $20 to $100, which is nuts. 
but considering how many people actually kept a loose sleeve thing that they probably thought was a budget game for their obscure DVD drive thing, it does kind of make sense, I think. The retail disc by itself is notably rarer, and it pops up maybe once or twice every year, though it is cheaper, and it goes for usually 20 to 40 bucks, so it's not too bad. Although in both regards, it's nowhere near as bad as finding the box. The box is like an entirely different beast, I mean, these days it's just depressingly rare and also very, very expensive. Quite possibly, in my opinion, one of the hardest big boxes to get in the hobby. This was one of the very first boxes I ever wanted in my collection, and it took me almost an entire freaking decade of searching to get a hold of it. I ended up getting this minty fresh one for about $200, and I know that's a lot. Personally, that's the most I've ever spent on a game, aside from Power Slave, which was around the same. Now, whether this is worth that much or not is up to you, but to me personally, the price I paid was, I think, justified, considering not only was this something that I spent so much damn time looking for, but it's also one of my favorite PC games of all time, one of my most played games of all time, and it is my favorite platformer ever out on any system that I've ever played. And the nostalgia is a bonus, so yeah, for me personally, it was worth it. On top of that, it was one of the cleanest copies of the game I've ever seen, and it was like seeing it on one of the shelves back in the day, so I just had to get it. It was like an offer that I couldn't refuse. I also feel very honored to say the only other box I've seen for sale was one that I linked over to Steven Kick to get his, although that in itself took a few years to find after I got mine. Should you personally pick up the physical copy? Um, that depends. Are you a huge fan of this game, or is it just a game that you want to play, or is it just something that you moderately like? Unless you are a gargantuan fan of this game like me, I suggest to avoid the hell out of getting the box, because it is a nightmare, it is expensive, and it has like nothing in it except the disc. So I would recommend, if you want a legitimate way to play it, grab one of the discs on eBay by itself. That way you have something physical and tangible that you can use as you need without spending the years of time searching or the hundreds of dollars on the box. It's just so much easier to do that. And if you don't want to spend any money or if you've never played the game before, then just download it off some abandoned war site or something. I don't know when or if Night Dive will ever be able to remaster it. I know Steven's interested, but the licensing issues with that game are just hell like pretty much every other monolith game from around that time. There was a sequel in development called Claw 2 or Claw 3D, I'm not entirely sure, but it was designed in Monolith's in-house Lithtech engine. And if you don't know about that, that's the engine that powered games like Blood 2, Shogo, Alien vs Predator 2, Kiss Psycho Circus, and it eventually went up to be upgraded and used for like No One Lives Forever and Fear and all that other stuff. In this game, Captain Claw was going to be grappling with, with the onset of menopause. grappling with different parts of his personality as a result of stealing a cursed artifact. This would have allowed some really cool shape-shifting mechanics, like one of them had him turn into a huge brute, another one turned him into a cute little kitten, and all this other kind of stuff. Sadly, they never ended up getting a proper publisher for it, so it never ended up seeing the light of day. Although Claw's Polish publisher, Techland, ended up developing what was rumored to be a sequel. Until they ended up releasing Nikita the Mystery of the Hidden Treasure all the way in 2009. It's not certain if that was originally going to be their Claw follow-up or not, but there were remnants of Claw all over the place, so it is easy to see why people assumed that this really was. I sure believe it was, but it wasn't ever something directly confirmed or not from what I could tell or find. There were really only two websites worth noting for Claw, the first one is the original one, and if you went to it back in the day, you wouldn't find a ton of stuff, but it did describe the futures, have a fully playable demo, some newsletter sign-up stuff for the game news, and forums with lots of people active and talking, and other links, high scores to check out, downloads for patches, level editors, sound pack, art files, and a game trailer, which I'll show you in a second. 
so there was a lot of stuff on there worth checking out, at least back in the day. Now the other website is a much to my surprise still active fan website called The Claw Recluse which has downloads for Claw and Modern Systems, which I'll also show you in a second, various updates, tools, forms, walkthroughs, tips, and even an ocean of hundreds of fan-made Claw levels to download, so you'll never really run out of stuff to play if you check these out. Much to my, and a lot of other people's, sadness, due to the game being marketed rather poorly, the team being very small and pretty unknown at the time, and the game being a 2D one instead of a 3D one in the late 90s, this game suffered as a massive commercial failure despite consistent praise across the board. It's a huge shame because we never really got anything aside from this game, despite it being so good, but as I said earlier, you could go to the Claw Recluse and download other stuff on there, there's lots of levels people have made, and there's also a Discord community that's semi-active, and I'm going to link that in the description if you want to join. His courage is legendary. His followers are loyal to the death. He is Captain Claw, the pirate scourge of the Seven Seas. Now you must aid him in his quest to escape from the prison known as the Rock and find the lost gems of the Amulet of Nine Lives. Monolith elevates the action-adventure gaming experience to a whole new level. Over 20 minutes of spectacular feature film animation multiple combat moves, and a variety of weapons to choose from. And finally, Claw is the first game of its type to allow up to 64 players to compete against each other across the internet. The Epic Saga Adventure, from Monolith Productions. As for my own personal story, I first played this game a very long time ago sometime in the early 2000s when I was just a little teeny thing. My dad had downloaded me a crap ton of games from abandonware sites or pirated them from others. Games like Tomb Raider, Worms 2, Ken's Labyrinth, and various other games. Of course, Claw was one of them too and I ended up spending so much time in that game and really loving like every second of it. But despite the hours I spent on it, I never really got that far. It was super super tough and none of my friends could ever get that far either, so I figured it wasn't me being a stupid little kid, and that it was actually a difficult game. Some time eventually passed, and I just kind of stopped playing it and ended up forgetting about it sadly. Until come 2008 or 9, when I had gained an interest in these big boxes, but had zero clue how to buy that stuff online, because I was still a little kid, I saw the artwork for it online and I was like immediately looking for it around so many retro game stores and thrift stores and computer stores and all of that stuff, but I never found one. And the search continued on and off for many years and by this point I was slowly starting to forget about it again over time until I for the second time rediscovered it, downloaded it from an abandonware site in 2013 or 14, put it on my Windows 98 when I finally got one again, that's a story for another day, I pretty much fell in love with it all over again and played it in bursts whenever I got the time. Again, like in my childhood, despite me playing it so much, I never really got that far, instead just replaying the early levels over and over again. Then fast forward again a few years until I finally got my hands on that box copy in 2018. I pretty much freaked out that I finally found the damn thing and I was so excited that it made me determined to finally beat the game. So following this, I installed it from the disc on my 98, ended up playing nothing but Claw, on and on and it took me pretty long considering it's a platformer. Then again, I was in college and busy with a lot of other stuff too, but I played through it. A whole week, nothing but Claw and studies. The last boss in particular took me an embarrassingly long amount of time, like a whole Another couple of weeks, if I can remember right, of just nothing but pure rage and anger and repeated attempts. It was probably the hardest final boss encounter I've ever had, and I mean I can't remember the last time, if any, where it took me over a freaking week to be the final boss. Yet, like I said, I was determined, and I was dedicated, and I was finally ready to just beat this game after such a long time. And Lo and behold, I finally finished the game, and could not have been more proud of myself. 
But then I started to wonder, how in the ever-loving kids in the late 90s were able to beat this game, if at all? I had heard stories about literally no one beating this game back in the day, and I could see why. Sure as hell none of my friends, or even my aunt who actually played this with me, they did patch the game to be a little bit easier after 1.2, which I'll explain later, but nah. I played the unpatched version 1.0. I earned those extra hairs on my balls. I can't tell you how happy I was both when beating the game finally and also finding the box, as crazy as that might seem if you're not a collector. Still right now in 2022, this game remains easily one of the most difficult games for me to acquire in my collection, only topped by the DOS version of Power Slave, which I made a huge juicy review on that you might also like and totally want to check out, something else called Hacks and its kinda quick equivalent called Eternal War Shadows of Light. But yeah, finding a complete package of this game physically and actually managing to beat it took me nearly a decade to accomplish both, and probably because so. The sheer amount of happiness I felt was like overbearing and lasted weeks, maybe even months, and every time I revisit this game or pick up the box and look at it, I feel that same overbearing sense of happiness as I did around then. Like it's almost therapeutic to me, it's weird. I don't think I can say any other game gives me that same sense of happiness when I look at the box or I beat it. Not even the rarer copies that I mentioned except for maybe Hacks, and not even my favorite game of all time, Blood, can do that. Which is really saying something, I think. This is a game that I just hold very close and dear to my heart. I have been dragging this on for a long time, I'm sorry. I should probably tell you how to install it. If you're using an older PC, the installation is very simple. Just shove in the disk for the installer thing to pop up, Follow the instructions for one of those blue screens of sweet nostalgia, and then you're done. And the GT style auto run thing will pop up, prompting you to play the game, and that's that's really it. If you do have an older Windows PC for gaming, then this is the best way you can play the game, especially on a CRT monitor. The fluidness, more vibrant colors displayed, and the responsiveness just work perfectly. Not to mention some of the later OS-specific issues the game has suffered tremendously from over the years, but luckily has some workarounds. Now, if you're on a modern machine, it is a little bit trickier, and in that case, I actually recommend avoiding the trouble of searching for a physical copy, like I said earlier. I would instead recommend going to that website called The Claw Recluse, so that you can grab a thing called Crazy Hook. Crazy Hook is pretty much the same base game, with full modern OS support. So that's probably what you're going to want to do. In order to set this up, you would just make a folder named Claw in your C drive or your games folder or whatever. You would download and extract the Crazy Hook download in there, and you would run Claw.exe, and that's really it. The only downside to this is that you won't get any of the cool cutscenes. You can watch those online separately if you want, or you can do what I do, which is a little complicated, and I'll only briefly say this to save time. But after Crazy Hook is set up, you can download the ISO of the DVD edition, also from the download section of the Claw Recluse. You can make a folder called Movies in the Crazy Hook directory, and then copy and paste all of the movie files on the DVD to this folder that you made, and then it should work. If I have enough people asking for help, I will make a video with a little bit more detailed information on getting everything in this game to work as intended. Lastly, it is possible to get multiplayer working, but you do have to download and use some sort of shitty client called Game Ranger. On the bright side, this thing is very useful for playing multiplayer matches of old Windows PC games like this, Emperor Battle for Dune, Dungeon Keeper 2, Red Faction, yada yada. I only said shitty because on the downside, it has tons of ads that are very, very freaking annoying and require port forwarding to host games, which can also be a little annoying depending on your internet provider. But aside from that, this thing is fairly decent and it was how I was able to capture the multiplayer footage for this video that I'll go over later. But yeah, once you're finally freaking done, holy crap, setting everything up it is finally time.
time to launch this hidden little gem of a game. Welcome to the world of Captain Claw. Start up the game, skip some logos, and you'll be dropped into the main menu. If you wait long enough, Captain Claw will run around on the top of the screen, which is a neat little replacement for all the demo stuff that 90s games were crammed with in the main menus. Personally, I loved seeing the demos, and seeing one in this game I think would have been pretty cool. The menu itself is pretty simple, allowing you to start a single player game or multiplayer one, replay the cutscenes, adjust options like player profiles, controls, light visual settings adjustment, and audio adjustment, and view the credits and default controls and all that other stuff, and you have the option to quit the game, although you shouldn't do that because this game is kind of amazing. When you're in this main menu it seems like there's a lot of stuff to pick from, but it's all an illusion. When starting a new game, it doesn't play any of the cutscenes, so if you want to see the story beforehand, either wait a while at the main menu for it to play, or select it from the Replay Movies option. The basic story goes, you are the captain of a group of pirate cats, named Cathan Nathan- Cathan? What the hell? You are the captain of a group of pirate cats, named Captain Nathaniel Joseph Claw. You and your buds are in the middle of a battle with the dog pirates, named the Cockered Spaniards, and he is... wait a second. Clear the debris! Clear the debris! Reload cutters and give them another round from our broadside! Is that...? No. No, there's no way. Yeah, here's Caleb. Yep, it is. I mean, it makes sense, because blood was what they were working on simultaneously with this game for a while, but hearing this as a massive bloodite when I first played this was surely enough to make my blood tingle. And yes, that is the one and only Stephen Waite. Whoa! Whoa! Ta-da! I always knew Nate and Caleb sounded so familiar, but I didn't confirm this until a few years ago when I got my boxed copy and replayed it, and also saw LGR's amazing video on it. Anyways, everything is going smoothly until Nate gets captured by their leader named Larao. You're then thrown into a prison and then find a note talking about a holy grail treasure of all treasures, this game, I mean, the Amulet of Nine Lives, which is this thing that's stated on the front and back of the box. You'll also find a treasure map leading you to the first gem, and this begins your large 14 level journey to collect more map pieces and more gems in order to complete the amulet. The story is pretty much told exclusively through these cutscenes, and in my opinion they're quite fun and really charming to watch. There's a lot of detail and it looks really fluidly animated. Some people have said that they think it looks kinda crappy like the Zelda CDI stuff, but I completely disagree. I think this looks awesome. Although, to be fair, some of the environments, like the ships, are like these cheesy 3D pre-rendered things, but otherwise, these are quite the treat to watch, and they look a lot like a 90s Saturday morning cartoon. And even back then, I would watch these over and over again until me and my friends would get together and we would all pretend that we were these character pirate dudes in these cutscenes, and it was just so much fun. Good times. But the beautiful visuals don't end there. They continue onward into the game itself, immediately starting you with escaping the ginormous prison and off to the great quest for the Amulet of Nine Lives. There's got to be a way out. Dude, the nostalgia is so strong. Every single time I see this, I get this really nice, warm, fuzzy feeling in my heart. No pun intended. This game is a genuine visual treat in all the right places. It was right at the end of the 2D era, but they chose to stick with it and make it a more polished experience instead of focusing on crazy 3D tech. And as a result, they pulled off some very, very cool, fluid, and smooth 2D visuals here, like layers in the level environment, 
tons and tons of little background details, and fluid and consistent animation throughout, as well as having some of the most detailed and colorful sprite work I have ever seen in a game. You'll get to go through 14 ginormous levels of sprite-based eye candy, like these jungles, undersea caverns, islands, old towns, uh, sewers, ghost ships, and many more. These levels are really quite large, and often take between 20 to 60 minutes to complete on a first-time playthrough, including the times you'll die and break your keyboard. Maybe like 10 to 15 minutes tops if you know exactly what you're doing and you manage to make it through without dying. Although there's going to be a pretty good chance that you're going to feel like it was a cheap death. So then you're going to go to the main menu and reload the save so that you get the live back. I don't know man. If you get through them and still are craving more claw, then you can download hundreds of other levels like I mentioned earlier. And from what I've played, they're not actually that bad. Some of them are really good, and a few of them are, believe it or not, I think even better than the base game itself. Which is crazy, I never thought I would say that for Claw, because the levels are so well designed, I don't know. You'll have to check it out yourself, but point being, if you finish the game and you have more time on your hands and you want to play more Claw that you've never experienced, then go and download those extra levels. There are so many of them out there, so you'll probably never run out of claw levels to bash your keyboard with. The controls are great, even with the default setup. Very simple stuff, you know, arrows to move, space to jump, left control to melee attack, left shift to switch weapons, left alt to attack with the selected special weapon, and Z to pick up and throw. The movement is consistently fluid, tight, and very smooth and responsive. You always feel like you're in control of the character, and that's honestly the most important thing when it comes to these kind of games. Aside from obviously the animations being good and stuff, and you know, the fun factor being in there, but still, you know. Very rarely, if at all, did I ever feel like falling in a pit or not being able to evade attacks was the game being unfair, even though a lot of people will probably disagree with me on that. I mean, I always felt like each death was my own fault. And that should probably tell you that even though, to most people, this game is crushingly difficult, that the game design in of itself is good. And I know people might disagree with me and be like, no, you're stupid, the game is f***ing hard. And it is. But again, every time I played and redid something, you know, with a different pattern, after noticing how I died, I was able to overcome that. So, very hard game, sure but game design good. As for the gameplay itself, it's a very simple and straightforward game, and while it seems really primitive for 97, I think they made the right call with its simplicity. It allowed them to really make a game that they could fine tune into a solid experience that they wanted. 2D platformers have been done to death throughout the 90s, so by the time this was being made, it seems like they really knew what to do, not only for the platforming veterans, but for gamers in general. Though, sadly, it was marketed horribly, and again, people were probably getting sick of the 2D platformer stuff by this point, especially when you had games like Mario 64 and Spyro the Dragon and all that out. Actually, scratch that, I don't think Spyro came out yet. But still, you had Mario 64, and you had 3D games that were completely different, but, you know, like Quake, it was completely 3D, and everyone just wanted to do that. Also Tomb Raider. You get what I'm saying. So to the general audience, it didn't really interest that many people, aside from people that were still actively 2D platforming fans. But luckily, the people that actually sat down and played the game seemed to really love it and make it known how surprisingly refined and polished it feels. There's nothing really more to the game aside from platforming, fighting the doggo pirates and other animals, collecting treasure, avoiding traps, lots and lots of traps, and exploring. It's very simple, yet surprisingly effective. It doesn't try to overdo anything, and it stays a sort of basic, you know, run-and-gun, side-scrolling platformer thing, but it excels in it in every way possible. The combat, the movement, the platforming, sweet Jesus, hallelujah, the audio and sound, the music, the score hunting for replayability in the leaderboards, and 
to literally everything. This game. <laughs> this game. Is just. Ah. And I never try to use this word, but it's. It's just a masterpiece. The level design is great. It's filled with very good enemy and item placement, traps, and death pits that are avoidable, but very easily missable. Another thing I really love about this game is how the whole thing feels very progressive, and you just never really saw this kind of thing in 2D platformers at all. At the end of the level, the cutscene basically shows Claw going from one area and just kind of going to the next, which ends up being the next level that you play. And on other levels, when you collect a treasure map, it shows Claw traveling to those. It made it feel like you were going from one place to the next, like you were on this cool adventure, instead of just going from one random place to another random place. Levels back to back had some common ground to add to this feeling, but every single level still had their own completely different palettes, textures, sprites, and whatnot, so it really added heavily to make every single level feel unique from each other and easily distinguishable. It's no wonder such a simple game at face value ended up taking two and a half years to make. Every level has a completely different theme with their own tile sets, enemies, item sprites, music, and even their own common little traps. As I said earlier, the game gets harder and harder by each level you complete. I really like this, because it doesn't just start off insanely difficult and stay that way, like a lot of other games. It's like a properly progressive difficulty that gets slowly more and more difficult with each level. But don't get me wrong, it is a pretty hefty challenge. If you die once in the first level, you better prepare yourself for a world of pain. I wouldn't call myself a pro or master at this game by any means, but I've played it enough to where I got fairly decent-ish, kinda sort of, I, I don't know, maybe I suck. But now I can get around halfway through the game without dying at all. But yeah, it does get harder as it goes, and it gets insanely hard, particularly once you reach level 12 at the island. So just be mindful of that, and I will explain why this game is as hard as it is, not just because of the death traps and all that, but... It's kind of more in with how the live system works, and how you can't quick save manually, like you can in most other PC games at the time. But, uh, yeah. This game was notorious for being so damn difficult. Pretty much like I've been saying for the past, like, 20 minutes or something. Most people that played it never managed to actually beat it. If you happen to be one of the few people that have beaten the game, you should probably give yourself a pat on the back. I don't think I talked about the save system yet, so also, there's no quick saving in the game. It only goes by checkpoint, and there's a live system to add to this, which is a big factor in why the game is considered notoriously difficult. Each time you go over these flags, they serve as a respawn checkpoint until you get to another one. But when you go over the golden flags, they serve as a save game flag. So if you quit the game, you can start back at the golden flag that you were last on. If you're at a point where you saved and you have like no lives left and barely any health, you could go to new game and pick another level to start fresh. Although doing this will revert your item count to their starting numbers and the lives count to three, so you really should only do it when absolutely necessary. Moving on to the weapons, there aren't too many in the game, but each of them are used for different scenarios. Your most basic and common one is your sword and your punch. Depending on your movement while hitting the attack key, Captain Claw will either throw out a punch or swing his sword. Punching isn't that far, but the sword is better for longer ranges. You can crouch attack with your sword, but it does minimal damage, while jump attacks do the most. This does give a good sense of risk-reward, since you can dodge a lot of attacks by crouching, while jumping makes you immediately more exposed, but lets you kill enemies easier. You can also press the Z key by default to pick things up, and then press it again to throw them. This usually includes these explody barrels, and a majority of the enemies you encounter. Personally speaking, I usually like to throw people into these pits of goop. What a weird word. Goop. Aside from these, you get what the game calls special weapons. You already start off with all of these, but you pick up more ammo or uses or whatever as you explore the levels. First up are the bundles of dynamite, and they pretty much took the pressure tossing mechanic from Blood's dynamite, 
where the longer you hold the key down, the further it gets tossed, and they're very useful for a lot of different situations, and they also look really cool. I mean, look at this. And yeah, I know, Bloods is more explodey and more violent, so Blood Dynamite Gang, but this one is still pretty cool. For long range attacks, there are two more things you have. You got the Flintlock Pistol, you know, the pistols that the pirates have. It's standard, but ammo is plentiful and extremely useful, often kills most enemies in a single shot or two, at least up until about a little over halfway through the game. Because then they start taking up like five or more shots to kill enemies, so eh, that's a little on the weird side. But the other one is basically the BFG of this game. You collect these magic ball things, I don't know what the f*** that is, to get more ammo for it. It's represented by this glowing hand icon in your inventory, and whenever you use it, it is by far the best weapon in the game. Although, you can get some items that basically do the same thing, just for some reason make things shoot out of your sword. I don't know why they did that, it doesn't really make any sense, but it's still pretty cool, so screw it. These all function pretty much exactly the same, just with different visual effects. The first of these is the Frost Sword, freezing any enemy it comes into contact with, then the Fire Sword, which burns them, and the Lightning Sword, which electrocutes them to death. Pretty metal. So while the sword shooting projectile stuff are weapons, they're not functioning in the same way that the last stuff I was talking about. I did not English properly, but basically those are more like power-ups, where you pick them up and they have like a little timer that goes down and you have to use that weapon in that window, otherwise you don't have it anymore. And that kind of blends into the actual power-ups that you get in the game, like these skulls that turn you invisible, these seizure-inducing orbs that make you invulnerable to all attacks except for death pits, and these glowing mice toys that make you jump really high while simultaneously making your sword do double damage. All of these run on a set limited time, just like the swords, and you can only use one at a time. So you gotta kinda make sure to plan your stuff out carefully. Along with these are the various ammo pickups that go with the weapons that I said earlier, and the various health pickups. Those health items consisting of things like bread and stuff that change depending on the level that you're on, all replenishing 5 health, as well as these small little vials that replenish 10, and these jars that replenish 25. And if you're real lucky and you search every nook and cranny, you can get these clap Captain Claw shit. You can get these Captain Claw heads that give you an extra life for a maximum of nine. Cat puns. I want to punch someone. <laughs> You'll need all of those lives, so if you see one, do whatever it takes to figure out how to get it without dying, of course. And lastly, there are tons and tons of collectible items littered throughout the levels, giving for a pretty high sense of replayability. In all of my days, there's only one singular person I've seen 100% this game without cheating. And in all honesty, I strongly doubt anyone else can match it or even have the patience to. There's coins, golden skulls, crosses, more coins, and lots of goodies, often hundreds of each of these to get in every single level. And chances are you've only gathered like maybe a quarter of them at the most. Despite it already being really difficult to do that, making it even harder is the fact that you're not going to see how many of any of these that you have until you complete the level, where it shows up in the stat screen. If you're playing on the original 1.0 version of the game, you could score a million points throughout the level, which is a freaking lot, in order to go and get an extra life. I don't know what kind of assholes they thought they were by doing that, oh my god. Which means, without scouting for well-hidden secrets or doing some crazy exploration off the main path, crossing instant death traps and all kinds of crazy shit, you're probably going to get either none or one life. Which is not a lot for a game where it's so freaking easy to die. Understandably, people were a little pissed off. And they were like, man, I thought I was getting some family-friendly cat platformer thing, and now instead I'm playing this game and getting the hairs ripped out of my asshole. And so, Monolith was like, 
Whoa, I'm sorry about that, man. Here, I'll make it a little bit easier for you. And so they patched this in version 1.2 onwards to make it a smidge more forgiving. So if you're playing 1.2 or higher, then if you collect 50,000 points, you get the extra life. Unless you're already at mine. And this means if you probably, you know, play it the same way as before, where, you know, you do just enough exploring and stuff and whatever, you'll probably get maybe one or two extra lives. If you get everything on the map, you'll probably get a couple. I don't really know. It's... It's hard. It's a tough game. Most of the enemies are more or less the same that get slightly stronger and slightly smarter as the game progresses. The two enemies that reoccur throughout pretty much every level are the mice and the seagulls, which are this game's most annoying enemy in-game ever award enemies. You're gonna hate them. And then you're gonna hate your life. And then you're gonna want to beat people up. The mice shoot cannons all the time and are kind of annoying. And the seagulls dash at you when you're at a certain range. Not too bad, but a little annoying sometimes. These guys are only in two levels, but they're also really irritating. They run up to you and they like, hug you? And it takes off like, what, five, ten, twenty f***ing points of health off? What? Everyone run! It's the hug of f***ing trash! Oh yeah, and these crab guys are really freaking annoying too. Probably the most annoying in the game. They hide in the shell and they're pretty much invincible until, you know, you gotta wait for them to peek out and then hit them and it's just really tedious and annoying. The other enemies are basically just the same enemies for the most part, as I said, that over time get reskinned and have better blocking AI and abilities and health. Despite the game's difficulty, I found it generally to be a fair game for the most part. I mean, it usually felt like dying was my fault. Aside from some of the cheaper death traps and probably the later levels where everything just felt like it was trying to kill you for no reason, but my point is, it doesn't feel right for me to criticize the difficulty as a negative point. At least not up until the island level, I believe. Yeah, that, that level was a pain in the ass. And the levels after that get really ridiculous too, especially the last one. Holy crap, that last one. But yeah. Game is generally not too bad if you know what you're doing and if you're pretty good at platforming games but those last levels are hard. I will say that. And I don't feel bad for complaining about those more annoying enemies that I mentioned because they could have done, I don't know, anything to make them slightly less annoying, but they're not. So those are probably gonna be my only real criticisms with this game. The difficulty part that everyone complains about is really just gonna boil down to personal preference, at least for most of the game. Another reason I hold this game as high as I do is because, well, take a guess. Wow, I've never seen anything like this before. Run, lover! They'll never get me! So far, so good! I mentioned it earlier too, I know, but I had to bring it up again. How can you not love this guy's voice? I mean, it's just perfect. Tell me where the gems are, and I'll let you live. Especially for the slightly, sarcastically, assholey, lovable cat pirate guy that we have here. I honestly think he did an amazing job here, let alone a game intended for kids. Oh yeah, off topic for a sec. But this game seems to not necessarily be for young kids as it's implied, because it's freaking hard, number one, especially for, like, younger kids. But also because it's got a little bit of violence in it. I was very surprised to see blood in this, an E-rated game about glorified cat pirates. I don't know, man. Look at that. Oh, he's bleeding. Always oh, bleeding. What was I even talking about? Oh yeah, the audio. The sound effects are great. The swishing of your swords, the clanking of the swords, the bubbling of the tar pits, the really stupid threats that random enemies give you. Oh god. The dynamite explosions and the explosions themselves, the water pedals, and just everything sounds great. It's all great, great stuff. 
and of course, by usual monolith standards, the music is great too. Pretty memorable stuff, especially for me at least. I was very surprised that nobody uploaded the full soundtrack. Shut up! Almost your microphone. No, shut up. I miss you. I was very surprised that nobody uploaded the full soundtrack to YouTube, so I did it myself a while back. And I've had multiple people request a review for this game since then. And I am very glad that I'm finally making one after all these years. I've played that first level so, so much that sometimes to make things more dramatic in the real world, I used to play the music for it in my head, and I still do from time to time. Moving on to what I don't think anybody has ever discussed in another review of this game so far, the multiplayer. You play through serial modem play, IPX, or through AOL's now defunct Engage client. Sadly, there's no deathmatch here, there's just level racing, and I think that might be the only reason this game's online play never truly took off. You can get this working as I mentioned in the beginning of the video by using a modern client called Game Ranger but it's kind of annoying to set up and it's probably not worth the hassle if you want to do it just for this game alone. I think it also works through Hamachi or whatever, but I've always had issues using that thing, so Game Ranger it is. This level racing is kind of weird in the sense that it's really just playing through the level with like a marker to show where your opponents are. Nothing really that special to it. It's a little bland, and it's a lot of wasted potential to just not have any deathmatch maps. I mean, Jazz Jackrabbit 2 nailed its multiplayer. That's like a perfect example of a side-scroller, platformer things, multiplayer done right. Abuse did a great job with this too. But this level racing stuff, while not necessarily bad, I don't think is really worth the hassle to go through getting to work nowadays. It can be an okay time passer, I guess, but... If you want a super addictive 2D side-scrolling like deathmatch thing on your PC, there's a lot more fun to be had with Jazz Jackrabbit 2 and Abuse. So, we finally come to this part of the video. Is Claw worth playing and does it still hold up today? You're goddamn right. It does if you couldn't already somehow tell. Not just for my nerdy nostalgia with this game, I mean, I genuinely believe that this game has aged better than pretty much any other 2D platforming game on the PC, period. With Jazz Jackrabbit 2 being a really close call, but really, if you play this game for at least a few minutes, it's really not that hard to see. It's just as fun now as it was 20 plus years ago, and from all the people I've had try it out for the first time here at my house over the years, they all seem to pretty much agree with me, sometimes playing it even longer than I expected. This game's silky smooth and fluid movement, tight controls, gorgeous graphics and animations, well thought out level design, Stephen Waite's existence being shown off, the very challenging but mostly fair gameplay, at least for most of the game, and the plethora of amounts of collectibles for lots of replayability all add up to make this, in my opinion, the ultimate 2D platformer game out there, and it's one of the few games I can think anyone can truly pick up and enjoy. 
The only thing to really be wary about other than the crazy difficulty as the game goes on is the few annoying enemy types, but other than that, this game is a real diamond in the rough and it's such a shame to me that it's so largely forgotten by most people here in the States. It does seem to have an oddly big fanbase across Poland and India specifically for some reason. I'm not sure if it got distributed way more over there or if word of mouth or something was stronger, but still, super cool to me that there's a community out there nonetheless. But as far as any of you watching this, regardless of where you are, if I can get at least one more person to play this timeless masterpiece of the art form, then I would have done my job properly. However you can, get a hold of this game and get on to simultaneously stealing and kicking some cockered Spaniard booty. Hey, if you like this, go check out my other reviews or drop a sub with the bell notification thing so you can see more in the future. This video was kind of a nightmare to make over the last couple of months, so thank you for watching, thank you for your support, and thank you for whatever third thing I forgot to mention. XOXO heart eye emoji.